It's arguable that no vehicle in America is more iconic than the Jeep Wrangler. Some people like to trace the history of the Wrangler back to the original World War II Jeep, but interestingly enough, AMC and now FCA don't really like to trace the Wrangler back quite that far. So whether you want to trace this all the way back to the original CJ Jeep in 1944 or the YJ in 1986, the Wrangler has been around for quite some time. And it has always been one of the most capable off-road vehicles you can just buy and then take right out on the trail. Unfortunately, tightening fuel economy regulations and safety regulations over the years have caused the Wrangler's future to be in question. But don't worry, FCA decided to really spend everything that they could to make sure that the Wrangler will be around for some time. And that's why we see an all new model for 2018. When Jeep announced that they were going to completely redesign the Wrangler, a lot of people were worried. They were wondering what exactly the new Wrangler would look like and what it would be like off-road. But fear not, this still has solid axles front and rear, just like traditional Wranglers. The doors come completely off, as you can see, just like a traditional Wrangler. There is still a four-door model. There's a two-door model coming up. You could take the roof off and you can even fold the windshield completely flat if you want to. And of course, most importantly, the Wrangler is still a body on frame SUV. We also have a lot of dedicated off-road design traits going on here. For instance, this large front bumper actually has removable winglets. So this outboard section on either side can actually be removed to improve clearance when you're off-roading. If you want to crawl up on a rock, something like that, well integrated tow hooks can be found right here. We have a spot where you can actually put a winch right there in the factory bumper. Halogen headlamps are standard. LED headlamps are now optional, making this a very modern vehicle up front as well. And of course, we still have the signature Jeep grille. And of course, instead of a typical hood release inside the vehicle, there are still straps on either side, although there's a latch in the front to help comply with modern hood regulations. So you just latch it down right there with those latches. Of course, if you like driving al fresco, you can even fold the windshield forward right like that. Now it is kind of a process to remove because there are four bolts that hold the windshield in place and you do have to use a ratchet to actually take them out. And then once this is down like this, you'd actually strap it to the hood in order to keep it from flopping around. The artist formerly known as the Wrangler Unlimited has now been renamed the Wrangler four door, which actually makes a little bit more sense to me. There is of course still a two door Wrangler available, although they are being produced a little bit after the four door Wrangler launches. So you should see those in dealers very soon. In terms of overall length, the two-door version comes in at 166.8 inches long. It's about 2.8 inches longer than last year. And if you want the fourth door back here, that stretches it out to 188.4. That's about a 3.8 inch stretch over last year. In order to help make sure that the Wrangler is just as capable as the last model, they've actually raised the vehicle up off the ground. So we now have up to 10.8 inches of ground clearance that helps accommodate the extra length of the vehicle, but still gives you relatively similar breakover angles. Speaking of breakover approach and departure angles, obviously they are superior in this version of the Wrangler to most other versions out there. One thing that Jeep did not change, however, is the overall width of the vehicle. This is still very narrow for a modern vehicle on American roads, and that really helps us out when it comes to off-roading. But you'll notice these massive bulges on each side. That's because instead of making the overall vehicle wider, Jeep decided to widen the track 2.5 inches. That again helps with stability and off-road ability. Out back, this is still instantly recognizable as a Wrangler. There is a definite attempt to make this look very industrial with these tail lamp modules that stick off the body, sort of like separate modules. And of course, we still have the spare tire mounted on this swing to the side tailgate right like that. In an interesting touch, the center mounted stoplight is part of this spare tire carrier, as is the backup camera right there in the center of the wheel. You actually have to unlock that with a star drive, pull the backup camera off, then you can unbolt and remove the wheel. So it's really important that you don't lose the toolkit that comes with your Jeep because that's how you remove the doors, you remove the top, etc. Speaking of removing the top, you'll notice that we have some connectors dangling over here. This is what would connect the rest of the top and the electronics that we find in there. And of course, the rear windshield wiper and the water supply for that rear windshield wiper unit. We have well integrated tow hooks down there at the bottom. And of course, a tow hitch receiver if you want to tow something with your Wrangler. One of the big reasons that people were concerned about the Wrangler's future is the way that the United States does fuel economy regulations. Because of the overall size of the Wrangler, it needs to get much better fuel economy in order to still exist in the US, or the manufacturer would need to make a lot of more efficient vehicles to offset the sales of less efficient vehicles like the Wrangler. And that's why we see more modern engines and transmissions under the hood. Things start out with FCA's latest 3.6 liter V6 engine, producing 285 horsepower and 260 pound-feet of torque. 
That engine is capable of getting you 20 miles per gallon combined thanks to an all new eight speed automatic transmission. If you want to save even more gas, you can get a two liter turbocharged engine that will produce 270 horsepower and 295 pound feet of torque, and it will be mated with the new FCA mild hybrid system. If that's still not enough for you, this will be coming with one of FCA's diesel engines very soon, and it is likely to beat the two liter turbo when it comes to overall fuel economy. It's also likely to beat all of the other engines when it comes to maximum torque. If you get the 3.6 liter V6 engine, you can still get a six speed manual transmission, but honestly, the best off-roading ability and the best fuel economy will happen with the eight speed automatic transmission. At this point in time, the two liter turbo is eight speed only. Depending on how far off the road you want to go, there are three different transfer cases available. You'll still find solid Dana axles front and rear, and you can get both of those axles with optional lockers. So this is one of the few vehicles in America with not only a center lock, but also rear and front lockers as well. A nice touch while we're under the hood is the fact that the hood actually opens as far as it does. So it's very easy to work on this engine yourself if you were so inclined. There's of course a prop rod up there as well if you want to put it in more of a traditional hood position. The model we're driving today is the Wrangler Rubicon, and I would actually rate these seats more comfortable than the average off-road pickup truck, especially if you were comparing this to something like the Chevy Colorado ZR2 or the Toyota Tacoma TRD Pro. We have adjustable lumbar support, even though this is a manual seat design, it's a knob at the front of the driver's seat. The seats also move up and down, and of course there's a recline function, but instead of a lever, it's actually this piece of webbing right here on the seat back. Suppose that's a little bit easier to deal with if you're getting in and out of the car without the doors. The extra length for 2018 definitely helps improve rear seat comfort. I actually have a decent amount of legroom sitting right here behind myself. And of course, headroom is pretty generous as you can see. The ceiling would be somewhere right up there. It actually is above these bars, the way that everything puts back together in here. Because of the narrowness of the Wrangler, the rear seat bench is a little bit on the narrow side. However, headroom is still fairly generous. In kind of a nice touch, rear seat passengers get two very small air vents right back here. We also have the window switches in the center console, not in the doors, and a 120 volt inverter right down there at the bottom. Of course, I suspect that most shoppers will likely have the rear seats folded most of the time, and if you do that, then you have a great deal of cargo area back here. But it's worth noting that if you remove the doors, obviously your cargo could end up spilling out the front. Speaking of cargo capacity, we actually have a reasonable amount of cargo capacity in the back of the Wrangler four door, even if you were to compare this to something like your average compact crossover. You can see you actually can fit quite a lot of luggage. We have a bunch of lighting in here, a bunch of bags, etc. All that very easily fits in there, of course, because the spare tire is not under there. It's right on the back door. Now it is worth noting that if you do a lot of parallel parking, getting in and out of the back can be a little bit tricky because of the way this door swings. We've left the top off for our look around the Wrangler. Everybody wave to Nick, who's there in the back seat. Uh, you'll notice that we have a number of little Jeep logos, which is kind of a nice touch. FCA does that a lot in their vehicles. So we actually have Jeep right here on this little section. And we still have the speakers on the bar that runs across the back. There's still a dome light right there in the middle. And then you can see those speaker grills again from the inside. Moving over to the front seats, we have height adjustable shoulder belts for the driver and front passenger and two-way adjustable headrests. Since we're driving the Rubicon model, we have leather upholstery with Rubicon embroidered right there on the top. The front seats are heated, but of course they're not ventilated. That's why you don't find any holes in them. Ventilated seats are probably a bad idea in a dusty off-road vehicle. Moving over to the front doors, we actually find a decent portion of the doors are made from soft touch plastic. So this upper section is all soft touch. Then we have a soft touch armrest right there and then some storage down there in that netting area at the bottom of the door. You'll notice that we don't have speakers, of course, in the front doors. Speakers are still right over here in the dashboard because if you remove the door, you'd still want to be blasting your tunes. Moving towards the front, we still have an assist handle right there at the front of that area. You can mount the side view mirrors onto the body so that we can drive along without the doors. We have some circular air vents right there in the dashboard. This dashboard section matches the exterior paint color. There's another handle right here, again, for off-roading ability. And then we have a very small glove compartment right over here on the passenger side. It's again because that speaker is occupying that other portion of the dashboard. The passenger airbag light is right up here above the rear view mirror. We have the mirror right there. And you'll notice this is also where we find the assist and SOS buttons for the integrated telematic system that's optional. In the center of the dashboard, we find a small storage cubby. Moving below that, we find two large air vents and then the latest FCA Uconnect infotainment system. As you can see, this version of Uconnect now supports Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. We also have, of course, the factory navigation if you're more interested in using that setup. You can control the climate system using this display as well. 
You also have access to the heated steering wheel, heated seats, mirror, dimmer, etc. You have direct access to our media over here if you'd rather use that interface rather than CarPlay, Sirius XM satellite radio. And of course, we have Uconnect integrated apps. You'll find the app manager right there so you can download more apps. This is also where you'll find the Sirius XM Travel Link delivered services. Below the infotainment screen, we find the engine start stop button, some physical controls for the infotainment system. We have volume over here with a power button in the middle, and then tune and browse enter right over there on that side. Then we have the controls for the climate controls. We have front defogger, rear defroster, the heated seat buttons right there, heated steering wheel control, auto mode for the climate control, the two zones along there. Then we have the mute button. We have a button to turn on and off the auto start stop system on the engine that helps save fuel, of course, improves the fuel economy number so the Wrangler will still exist. Turn off the traction control with that button right there. And then we have a hill descent control button on this side. And finally, a screen off button if you want that display to turn off. Below that, we find a 12 volt power port, the buttons for the power windows, and then a media input over here, USB-C, regular USB, and auxiliary input. There's also another USB input in the center console. Below those controls, we start finding off-roading specific controls. For instance, the rear locker as well as the front locker control. You can lock the rear only or the rear plus the front. We also have a button to disconnect the sway bars. And then we have four auxiliary buttons, which you can use for aftermarket features. We then have a more traditional lever for the four-wheel drive system. So if we put this car into neutral, we can then shift from too high to four high, move across to neutral if you want to flat tow your Wrangler. And then we can go all the way down to four low right there. Now that we're in four low, we can put this vehicle in drive, and then we can lock the differentials, lock the rear, lock the front plus the rear, and of course, disconnect the sway bar. The gear selector is a pretty traditional console shifter. Drive is all the way down to the bottom, manual mode over to the left. We press away from the driver for up, pull towards the driver for gear down. You'll notice we have a little Willys Jeep icon right there on the top. Between the front seats, we have two large cup holders. There's also an area where you can stick your key if you wanna make sure that it doesn't fly out if you're wearing shorts without pockets. And then we have a handbrake right over here. Also between the front seats, we find a padded center armrest. This opens in two different stages. We have a small storage tier with a rubber mat inside where you could put smartphones, wallets, keys, that sort of thing. We then have a deeper compartment below that where I have my smartphone, so you can see that for size reference. We have that extra USB input right back there. Behind this console, you can see we have the two rear air vents. The instrument cluster is very similar to some of Jeep's other products. We have a physical speedometer and tachometer, and then everything else is being delivered by this color multifunction display in between everything, including the status of the four-wheel drive system. So for instance, if I put the car back in neutral, even though that is a mechanical lever, you'll notice that it does show what mode the system is in. So right now we've moved all the way back to too high. It automatically unlocks the front and rear differentials when you do that. The color multifunction display functions very similarly to other FCA products. We have things like uh, vehicle info, we have off-road information. It tells us right now that the sway bar up front is disconnected. It also shows you steering angle right there like that. And of course, we have the inclination displays as well. This is also where you'll find fuel economy information, the ability to change certain vehicle settings, trip computer information, status of the start-stop system, vehicle safety systems, audio information, vehicle messages, and a variety of different gauges that are not displayed physically, for instance, transmission temperature, engine oil temperature, etc. The steering wheel is similar to other Jeep designs as well as the new Ram 1500 pickup truck. These button modules are actually more similar to what we see in the new Ram. You'll find the cruise control buttons over here on the right side. On the left side, we find the button module that controls that multifunction display, as well as the dedicated voice command button, phone hang up and pickup button. You notice we don't have sport grips up top. That's pretty typical in an off-road vehicle. And this is a large round wheel. You'll notice that we don't have infotainment buttons on the front of the wheel. That's because in typical fashion for FCA, they're actually on the back of the wheel. We have track up and down and mode on this side. And then we have volume up and down on the other side. Quite logically, on the front doors, we find the lock and unlock buttons. Obviously, if the door was not there, we wouldn't need those. And this is also where we find the mirror controls right over here on the door. I do find it interesting that the mirror... Now, I do find it interesting that the window controls are not over here. They actually do stay in the center console, as I said earlier, even though these are power windows. And obviously, if you didn't have the door on, you wouldn't be able to raise or lower the window. Instead of inserting someone else's advertisement here, I'm inserting my own. So hit that subscribe button down there if you please. Subscribers help us get access to the vehicles like you're seeing in front of me right now. The Lexus LX570, the Lincoln Navigator, this Range Rover right here, the absolutely insanely fast BMW X6M, and the just completely crazy Mercedes-Benz G550. 
you wouldn't be seeing these vehicles on my channel if I didn't have all of you subscribing. So thank you for everybody who already has subscribed. And if you haven't, please hit that button down there at the bottom of your screen. The Wrangler is arguably the most off-road capable vehicle in Jeep's lineup. Just about every manufacturer, including Jeep, has really been chasing on-road drivers, even in their core models, like the Jeep Cherokee, the Jeep Grand Cherokee, etc. It's just the nature of the beast. More people drive their SUVs on-road than off-road. But the Wrangler is one of the few vehicles that is still obviously very dedicated to off-road ability. And on the downside, that does obviously compromise the on-road ability of this vehicle. So with this generation of the Wrangler, FCA sought to do the impossible, or at least the very, very difficult. Try and design an off-road capable vehicle that really has improved on-road driving dynamics. And there is definitely a difference between this and the last generation of the Wrangler when you do drive this out on the road. One of the big ways that Jeep was able to do this actually is this disconnecting sway bar setup. Because when you're off-roading, you want either a very wimpy sway bar or you really don't want a sway bar at all. That way you can get the maximum articulation going on in the suspension. But obviously on-road, you don't want to be driving around a wet noodle. You don't want to drive something that's swaying side to side a great deal. So if you can disconnect those sway bars electronically and easily, you can have the best of both worlds. And that's what we see in this vehicle. This particular system is less complicated and less expensive than the KDSS system that we see in some of the Toyota vehicles. That basically does the same sort of thing, only it's doing it with a hydraulic system, not just a mechanical latch on the sway bar setup. In addition to the disconnecting sway bars, Jeep also gives us the eight-speed automatic transmission, which helps us have more ratios for off-roading and for on-roading ability. Previous generations of the Wranglers really did have their engines screaming when you were on the highway in order to give you that very aggressive crawling ratio for off-road use. But we don't have to do that anymore with modern transmissions. So the 8-speed automatic has a very low first gear that gives us excellent off-roading ability and allows a very, very low crawl ratio, but also gives us a high ratio to help improve highway fuel economy. And that's how we get the 20 miles per gallon combined. In addition to that, Jeep redesigned everything, including the suspension, to help improve on-road dynamics. And it definitely is noticeable. Now, on the flip side, this is still very noticeably an off-road oriented vehicle. So this is not gonna drive like your modern crossover because that's not the mission of this vehicle. Large bumps will still upset the chassis just a little bit. This is, of course, still a body on frame SUV. So there are moments where it feels like the body and the tires are doing something a little bit different from one another. But when it comes to tackling bumps off the road, this really does them incredibly well. Keep in mind that the Wrangler can have nearly 11 inches of ground clearance. So obviously that's gonna hamper the handling ability. Now let's dive into the numbers. We scored zero to 60 in 9.1 seconds in the model that we're driving. This is the 3.6 liter V6 with the automatic transmission, and it is the Rubicon version. Because of the overall effective ratios involved in this particular model, especially with the larger tires, I expect that some versions of the Wrangler will go faster zero to 60 than what we're driving right here. Braking distances are obviously compromised a little bit by the tire choice on the Rubicon, but this still is fairly respectable for an off-road vehicle especially. As far as off-road dedicated vehicles go, you could call the off-road versions of the Toyota 4Runner, the uh, Tacoma TRD Pro, perhaps the Colorado ZR2, direct competitors to this vehicle. But aside from those, if you're looking for vehicles with front and rear lockers, the selection is very limited and may even include something like a Mercedes-Benz G-Wagon. When it comes to our overall ride score, I'm going to have to give this particular model a C+. The short wheelbase versus some of those off-road pickup trucks definitely hampers the ride score. And of course, the general off-road orientation of this vehicle does as well. But this is definitely more civilized than the previous generation of the Wrangler. So if you're looking for a vehicle that you can off-road on the weekends and you can still drive to the office come Monday morning, this is actually not going to be that bad of a choice. It's a little bit difficult to talk about cabin noise because we do have the top removed at the moment. So I'm just going to leave that a question mark for now. The top does take a great deal of time to put on and take off the vehicle. And some of the other folks that have been driving this Wrangler today have had the top off. So I didn't want to bother to put it back on. That would have meant spending less time in the vehicle overall. When it comes to overall fuel economy, it has been doing fairly well. We've been averaging about 19 miles per gallon in mixed driving with this model. We haven't been doing too much off-roading. So keep that in mind, of course. If you are going to take this off-roading, that fuel economy score is going to drop. 
If you want the best fuel economy in your Wrangler, you should wait for the upcoming diesel engine because that is likely going to be considerably better than the model that we're driving right here. We don't know all the details for that diesel engine yet, but it is likely going to be the three liter diesel engine out of the Ram pickup truck line. So expect it to actually have fairly good performance. It's probably gonna be around 240 horsepower, somewhere around 400 pound feet of torque. So it really is going to be the stump pulling Wrangler that you might've always wanted. Overall, the Wrangler is definitely impressive. It's difficult to make a vehicle that is this capable off-road, but still be enjoyable and livable on-road. And that is really the mission with this vehicle. It's also difficult to make an off-road capable vehicle like this achieve modern fuel economy standards. And again, they really have been able to do that with the new Wrangler. I would say that the off-road and on-road ability of the Wrangler is impressive, but not surprising really, because this is such an iconic vehicle that Jeep had to make this the best Wrangler ever. Otherwise, it wouldn't really fit in with the crowd. If you're interested in buying a more on-road focused vehicle that still has a lot of off-road performance, Jeep has a variety of other vehicles for you. But if you're interested in a vehicle with the ultimate off-road ability and you're willing to give up some of that civility, then this would be the right Jeep for you. If you want to do it all on your own, you can do that, of course, but Jeep has also included the latest off-road assist systems in the Wrangler, including their excellent hill descent control system. When you compare this to the hill descent control systems that we see in the Lexus LX or the Toyota Land Cruiser or even the Toyota RAV4 and Tacoma TRD Pro, this is a great deal smoother. In the Toyota products, if you're at the slowest crawl ratio, right now we're at the 0.6 mile per hour crawl speed, it is a very jerky experience. You can really feel the car bopping back and forth, and that actually ends up being worse for crawling down, especially loose, gravelly, or rocky surfaces. We don't see that in the Wrangler. We see a lot of control, a lot of smoothness in the system. You can, of course, crank this all the way up to crawling down the hill at a more reasonable five miles an hour, because the surface that we're on right here is really not very challenging. I'm just doing this to show you how the system functions. But if you wanna crank it down, all the way back down to that very smooth 0.6 mile per hour speed, you do that with a shifter, and now we're down here crawling at that 0.6 mile per hour speed again. Some experienced off-road folks will scoff at hill descent control systems, but there is a logical reason that you want one in your modern off-road vehicle. If you're going down a hill and it's really slippery, obviously not the surface that we're on right here, mind you, and you press on the brake pedal, you're braking all four wheels at the same time. But if you use the hill descent control system, you can actually brake individual wheels. And that really is the key to that particular system's performance ability. I know that sounds an awful lot like an anti-lock brake system, but it actually takes things to the next level. Because depending on how the system is programmed, sometimes it actually may be advantageous to partially lock up a wheel for just a little bit as you're going down the hill. Bottom line, the Wrangler is still a hoot and a half off-road. But a little bit different than previous generations of the Wrangler, it's acceptable when you start driving this out on your favorite winding mountain road. And remember, winding mountain roads frequently lead to excellent off-road adventures. So both of those things are important in an off-road vehicle. And I think if you're really off-road focused, this is just about the right balance because you don't really want too much on-road ability. It would detract from that off-road ability. And this still has all that trail claiming ability that you want. So how much will the Wrangler set you back? Well, the base sport trim two door will cost $27,495. If you want the four door, that will set you back $30,995. For 2018, the Sahara trim will be found exclusively on the four door model. That will start at $37,845. The four door Rubicon we've been looking at here, $40,995 starting. And of course the model we're looking at, which is a well-equipped Rubicon four door, came in at $53,200. Some of the options that you'll probably want on your Wrangler are going to cost you extra. The eight-speed automatic transmission is a $2,000 upgrade over the manual transmission in every model. If you want the two liter turbo, that's an extra thousand dollars over the V6, but you also have to get the eight-speed automatic. The hard top on the model that we're looking at right here starts at $1,095. And if you want it in body color, which you can get, that will set you back $2,095. Now, 53,000 might sound like a lot to spend on a Wrangler, but keep in mind that something like a Forerunner TRD starts at $42,875, and there are plenty of off-road vehicles that are considerably more expensive than this. And of course, if you get that Forerunner TRD, you won't have a removable roof or removable doors. So if you want something like this that has these classic off-road vehicle features like the removable doors, the fold-down windshield, etc., it is going to cost you. Now, you will have to wait until we can get our hands on one of these for a complete week so we can do our usual review and comparison section. So in the meantime, tell me what you'd like to see me compare the Wrangler to when we do get our hands on one for a full week. But until that time, if you're looking for one of the ultimate off-road vehicles available in America, 
the Wrangler is definitely something that you should keep in mind. Thanks for taking the time to check out this video. Again, I'm Alex Dykes, and this has been the 2018 Jeep Wrangler. Be sure to hit that subscribe button down there at the bottom of your screen. If you want to support our channel, click up there to go to our patron page, and I'll see you later.